Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, from time to time, I go back and take a look at some of my very earliest work on the channel. The reactions began in December of 2020. Uh, so about two and a half years ago. And there are a few that I did when I was still in my basement and didn't have a green screen and was still working out the format and things like that and didn't have balance quite right with the volume. Sometimes I talked over it because I was still learning how to interact with these reaction videos. And so I, I feel like that in a few cases, the videos are good enough in terms of what I'm reacting to that they're worth going back and doing right or at least better. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today with Henry VIII by Oversimplified. If you have not seen my other Oversimplified reactions, there's a whole playlist that this will be a part of. And I'll also put links down in the description to those other videos if you want to check them out. I'm guessing we're going to have some new Oversimplified pretty soon. Last year, one came out in March. He usually does about two a year. And totally understandable because it takes a ton of work. Uh, the animation, the writing, the uh, recording, all of it. Uh, no doubt takes a ton of time and as always I want to make sure that we are giving full credit to the original content creator So I'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out without my commentary This is an area of history that I have spent a lot of time studying the Wars of the Roses And then the aftermath of the Wars of the Roses because Henry VIII is kind of the first king who is after uh, and, and he in the early part of his reign he's still kind of dealing with some of the aftermath of the Wars of the Roses. So let's go ahead and dive in. Oh, Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Tell me, was I a good king? Uh, you were okay. Will I be remembered as the great warrior king who invaded France, revolutionized English healthcare, and developed great parklands? Um, no. probably not. Because of the wife killings? Because of the wife killings. And not just the wife killings, though. I mean, he, he had two of his wives executed, uh, but tens of thousands of other people whose names we will never remember. Sigmund, how did I get here? I still remember the good old days when I was a boy with a heart full of fire. And mummy would teach me. Okay, Henry, this is a horse. Can you say horse? Ho, ho, divorce. What? No. Okay, let's try this one. Can you say loaf of bread? L loaf with her head. So his, his mom is Elizabeth of York. And uh, Henry, we're not going to dive real deeply into the history of the Wars of the Roses, but the Wars of the Roses is a term we use to describe what was really a dynastic family conflict. Uh, a civil war, a, a series of wars, really, between what we know as the House of Lancaster, which is the Red Rose represents, and the House of York, which is the White Rose. And Henry's father, uh, Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor, as he was known, is from an illegitimate line that really had no legal basis for claiming the throne on the Lancaster side, except for the fact that eventually all the other Lancastrian uh, claimants were dead, and so he was the only one they had left they could even attempt to use as a claimant. And Elizabeth of York, uh, assuming her brothers were indeed dead, they were known as the princes in the tower, is at this point the heir to the York side of this equation. And so Henry Tudor, Elizabeth of York marry each other. They unite the houses of York and Lancaster. And Henry VIII is eventually going to be, become the king. He wasn't supposed to be the king. His older brother was. But he's going to become the first king that unites those two houses. And he'll create what's called the Tudor Rose, which you'll see often. Uh, it's a white and, rose, or white and red rose together in one. No, Henry, that's wrong. You know what? Last one. Okay. Can you say soap? Soap. <laughs> yes, that's it. I'm the supreme head of the church. Not yet. Screw the Pope. You know what? You're my son and I love you, but you're freaking weird, man. The year is 1491. England has just come out of three decades of civil war in which a bunch of Henrys, Edwards, and one Richard had a little ding-dong over which royal house should rule the realm. And it's important to note that he, how he said it is right. It's, it's not the War of the Roses, it's the Wars of the Roses because there's a number of conflicts uh, with a number of people fighting and different people claiming the thrones at different times. Finally, a Henry I, Henry VII, and he had a son. 
What should we and Henry the Seventh is uh, he's known as Richmond in the Shakespeare plays because he was the Earl of Richmond. Um, he was uh, descended from, like I said, an illegitimate line, but he wins the throne by right of conquest, defeats Richard the Third in battle at Bosworth Field, has Parliament predate his reign to the day before the Battle of Bosworth so that then he can turn around and argue that everybody who fought on Richard's side, they weren't fighting with the king, they were fighting against the king. Little legal maneuvering, but has big implications. We name him. My royal lineage is full of Henry's. A Arthur. fine name, a vigorous name, a tenacious name, a muscular name. How about Arthur? And so Arthur, Prince of Wales and next in line to the throne, was born. Five years later, Prince Henry was born, but nobody cares about him. He's, He's not the heir, just a spare. The king wanted to make an alliance with Spain. So one day, he said to his son Arthur, Hey, baby, you see that lady baby? That's going to be your wife. But father, I'm not even three years old yet. Listen, there's something you have to understand. You're my son. But more than that, you're a political bargaining tool. But you love me, right? I love you as a political bargaining tool. Yay. Hey, Pop, <laughs> who the heck are you? I've written you a poem. Listen here, tiny man. Can't you see that I'm busy, but I'm your son. I have another son? As Arthur was in another palace, being prepped to become king, Henry lived with his mother and two sisters at Eltham, where he was being trained for a church career. Yeah, he uh, he was, in fact, being trained for a church career, and uh, that was a pretty common thing to have happen. And, of course, the girls are both going to become queens uh, in their own right. One will become queen of France. The other is going to become queen of Scotland. Um, she's going to marry uh, the, the Queen of Scotland. She's going to be married to uh, King James IV of Scotland, who is going to die in battle fighting against England uh, and against his uh, brother-in-law's country, basically. Uh, the Queen of, of France, her husband will eventually die. She'll come back and marry Charles Brandon, who's played by Henry Cavill and the Tudors. And not just that. Henry learned languages. He played sports. He learned the recorder. What a nerd. Am I right? Wrong. Henry was the coolest kid around. So I told my Latin teacher he could kiss us my buddyus. He was very popular. He's described as very handsome, very athletic. This image that we have in our minds of fat bearded Henry VIII, that's really only at the end of his life. For and he only lives what? He lives to be in his late fifties. But I would say up until he's about 40, early 40s, very healthy, very athletic, very handsome. It's only later on after a jousting accident, he's going to start to go downhill. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Great scholars and theologians from across Europe came to meet and teach the young Prince Henry, who by all accounts was a very enlightened, bright and yeah. charming young boy. Everybody loved Henry. And out of everything Henry was taught, more than anything, he came to adore and respect theology and Catholicism. One of Henry's tutors was English poet laureate John Skelton, who wrote a textbook for Henry that we still have today. In it, he wrote a number of important lessons for the young prince, such as, do not be mean loathe gluttony and do not violate widows important lessons for any nine-year-old boy around this important lessons for any nine-year-old boy uh he's also going to be mentored by uh, thomas moore who's going to become one of his leading um, members of his government is going to be his chancellor and uh is going to unfortunately be one of the people who ends up being executed by henry for not submitting to his authority on the church uh and his desire to wed, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, yeah, and Henry is going to actually at one point be named Defender of the Faith by the Pope because at about this time that Henry's rising to become, he's eventually going to become king, um, Martin Luther is doing his thing over in Germany and uh, he's going to be doing a lot of writing and Henry's going to start writing refutations of Martin Luther and of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so much so that the Pope's going to praise him as defender of the faith. And, and uh, just really angry, violent stuff that's going back and forth uh, between Henry and some of these Protestant leaders, which is really fascinating when you then consider Henry's later life, uh, in which he's going to break away from the church in Rome. This time, Henry's older brother Arthur, now 15 years old, was married to Catherine of Aragon, sealing the union between England and Spain. And then he died. Oh, my alliance with Spain. He didn't die right away. It was several months, and this is going to become a big point of contention later on because uh, the argument is going to be made that Arthur never consummated his marriage 
to Catherine of Aragon, which is going to become a, a big condition for Henry marrying her. And then they're going to argue later that he did. Um, and, and part of it goes back to Arthur apparently made some joke to some of his friends about how last night I was in Spain, um, which is why a lot of people think he did in fact consummate the marriage, but we'll never know for sure. Spain, my poor, poor alliance with Spain. And your son, sire? Oh, yes, of course, my son. But mostly my alliance with Spain. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? Oh, yeah. And just like that, an unprepared Prince Henry was now the new heir to the throne. Fascinating thing the here with this, Henry is the Duke of York. And the title Duke of York has been given out a number of times throughout history. Typically given to the second son, the spare. And every time that that has happened, that a Duke of York has been given that title, he has either ended up becoming king because his older brother died, or uh, died, or in the case of George VI, his older brother abdicates, or died without any sons, and the title went back to the crown to be given out again later on. It's just really kind of weird how that happens. Um, but yeah, Henry is now going to marry Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon, it's fascinating because this is right about the time that Spain has become a united country rather than Aragon, Castile, you know, these, these warring or these separate kingdoms in Spain. And Catherine of Aragon's parents, if you grew up here in America, you probably grew up learning about Ferdinand and Isabella, who were the ones who sent Christopher Columbus on his mission uh, to the New World. And those are Catherine of Aragon's parents. About that alliance with Spain. Well, the solution was simple. Hey, boy, see that full-grown woman over there? That's going to be your wife. What, my brother's widow? Yes. You're a freaking weirdo, man. All right, so, so one completely random and minor quibble I have right here. That's Hampton Court Palace they're shown in the background, which not only I don't think had been built at this point, but certainly wasn't owned by them. Hampton Court Palace is built by Cardinal Wolsey, who is going to be Henry's kind of right-hand man running the show when he's king early on. Uh, and then it's going to be given to Henry VIII. So at this point in Henry's life, it certainly would not have been a place that they would have been living. Man, now in the Bible, there's a verse that says marrying your brother's widow, that's a big no-no. So the king needed... It doesn't really say that, though. In fact, there's other scriptures that talk about how if a, if a man's brother dies without having children, that you should take that man's widow as your wife and your, the children you have with her would be your brother's heirs. Um, so I think Henry conveniently found a scripture that didn't really mean what he said it meant to make his argument. To convince the Pope and get his special permission. Hey, can I please have my son marry his brother's widow? Eh. Sure, why not? And so it was. Henry's life was turned on its head as he was moved to the royal court, next in line to the throne. So that was called papal dispensation. In other words, the Pope had to give special permission because of the close relatedness of Henry to his brother's widow. But tragedy struck when just a few months later, his mother, with whom he was very close, suddenly died in childbirth. The loss of his mother almost certainly had a big effect on the young boy. His mother, Elizabeth of York, dies, I think, in her early 40s, late 30s, early 40s. Um, and she died of something they called childbed fever, um, which is going to be a big deal because later on, Henry's uh, third wife, Jane Seymour, is going to finally be the one that delivers him a son that he so desperately wants. And then she's going to die of childbed fever. And there's this scene, I don't know whether it actually happened, but there's a scene in the t TV show The Tudors where you see Henry standing in the doorway looking at, uh, at his wife uh, and he, she's, she's not feeling well and he looks at her and he, he says to somebody, he says it's childbed fever. I know because my mother died of it. In his older years, King Henry VII went on a bit of a paranoid trip. As was normal for a king at the time, Henry VII had had to quell a number of rebellions. And as he aged, he became ever more suspicious of the nobility around him. To keep them in check, he began levying huge, ruinous fines, left, right, and center. Dukes, bishops, barons, even his own mother. No one was safe from his tyranny. And the nobility of England... And Henry, Henry Tudor's mother, Margaret Beaufort, was just 13 years old when she got pregnant and had him uh, and never had any other children after that. And a lot of people speculate that it was because she was so young 
when she had him that it probably just destroyed her ability to have future children because she was married several times. England began to suffer. So when Henry VII finally got sick and died just after Christmas 1508, there was a lot of celebration. And I know I'm pausing a lot, but um, I should mention that at the point Henry VII dies, Henry VIII has not married Catherine of Aragon yet. He didn't marry her until after he became king. Not only because the tyrannical Henry VII was gone, but because his replacement was the ever popular, charming, and handsome 18-year-old King Henry VIII. Henry married Catherine of Aragon in June 1509. You may be wondering, if it's so weird to marry your brother's widow, and since he's now king, couldn't Henry just decide not to? Well, yes, he could, but by now, Henry wanted to. The thing about Henry that was unlike many kings of the time was he married for love. And he so did his grandfather, though. His grandfather, remember, Henry VIII is descended from the Plantagenet kings on his mother's side. So his grandfather is King Edward IV, who was the one who finally wins the Wars of the Roses for the Yorkist side, at least for a while. Um, and Edward IV married his wife, uh, Elizabeth Woodville. You could say love, you could say lust, but it was an attraction. It definitely was not a good idea diplomatically. In fact, it made a lot of really big headaches for him that he married a not only an English woman, but an English woman who was not royalty and whose first husband had been a Lancastrian. He had grown quite fond of Catherine, very fond. Historians say their marriage was unusually good. And so he was coronated king. And what a king. Compared to his tyrannical father, he was an absolute joy. Having the blood of two royal houses, he was white. So there you go, there you have the Tudor rose with the white and the red mixed together. And in fact, to this day, you'll see those roses being used as symbols of uh, the counties of York and Lancaster, which are both up in the northern part of England. Um, in fact, even some of the football teams, some of the soccer teams, right, they have the, you'll see the rows in some of their, uh, their shields, their um, logos. Widely supported. He was really, really ridiculously good looking. And those famous calves could achieve world peace. Famous calves. There are actually contemporaries who wrote about how amazing his calves were. That's why they made that joke. Henry, now that you're king, you know what that means. Costume party! Henry pranced around the palace playing dress up with his friends. He wrote plays. He sang songs. He danced. A true renaissance man. Yeah. Very different from the gluttonous wife killer we think of today. In his early reign, people from near and far would come to ask favors of the generous king. Hey man, could I gain ownership of some land near Upton Snodsbury? Sure thing, pal. Hey, could I be an earl or a baron or a viscount or something? Anything you want, man. Could I get like just like a really cool pig that has like freaking metal wings and eight legs and shoots flipping lasers and it can grow more a pigs laser out of pig? it for extra pigs? Say no more. Hey guys, I was just checking up on the financial report and what the hell? We can't afford this. Henry's council that he inherited from his father weren't happy with all the money he was just throwing around, and they worked hard to curb the king's spending. Since they controlled the royal seals needed to get stuff done, at first they were largely able to control the young king. And for Henry, the most infuriating things of all was they wouldn't let him joust with his friends because it was too dangerous. Yeah, so jousting, you have to remember, this is a pretty big deal at the time. This was kind of one of the things that nobility did for fun, for sport. It was the big kind of crowd-pleasing event. It's the successor in some ways to something like the Roman Colosseum, uh, things like that. Um, but if you want a, a really cool movie that kind of portrays jousting in the way maybe people would have seen it at the time, there's a movie called A Knight's Tale, if you've ever seen it. Totally fictitious and, and does this really kind of cool thing where they use modern songs and modern elements to kind of put it in, but it gives you a sense of how jousting was seen at that time and how these knights who jousted were kind of seen as rock stars. Uh, and Henry loved jousting and he was very good at it, but jousting is something you can't really do as king because it's dangerous. There was a king of France who died in a jousting tournament. Nor would they let him do the thing he wanted most, to go on a great, glorious, and expensive conquest against England's historic enemy, France. You have to remember at this time the King of England also claims the title King of France and that goes back to Edward III who's one of Henry's ancestors who claimed an inheritance and probably had a pretty legit argument to the throne of France. Please guys I'll keep it cheap. How? I'm glad you asked. I've got 
a promo code. Here we go. Honey. The financial burden of war? Yes. Honey is the free browser extension that automatically finds promo codes when you shop online. Imagine you're on one of your favorite websites. Not that one. And you want to reinvent yourself with some fresh new threads. Oh, hi, little dancing man. Got any sick promo codes for me? You do? Nice. You just saved $40 on your online shop. You rock star. Honey supports over 30,000 online stores and has already helped over simplified viewers save over $87,000. That's a lot of moolah. Not having Honey is literally saying no to free money like a crazy person. It's like free, a crazy person. finds coupons with one click, and it's now part of the Venmo and PayPal family. So you know it's legit. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash oversimplified. That's joinhoney.com slash oversimplified. And you'll also be supporting my channel. So thank you. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, sexy calves, excessive spending, and war with France. Henry wanted glory. He wanted to go down in history. If he didn't go to war in France, was he even the King of England? Remember, he is, his name is Henry, and there's a line of Henrys that go back, and he's looking at guys like Henry VIII, who wins this incredible uh, surprise, unexpected uh, victory at Agincourt against the French, and Henry V's son, Henry VI, is actually going to become, at birth, he's going to be the heir to two kingdoms, England and France. But then within a hundred years, all of that has been lost. And so Henry is going to be growing up, hearing the stories of how close England came to controlling France as well. And he wants to get that back. Man, I want to go to war so bad, but the council won't let me. Hey, maybe I can help with that. Wolsey. Whoa, it's Cardinal Wolsey, one of my best friends. Despite being an old ass man, Cardinal Wolsey knew that if he helped King Henry, there'd likely be something in it for him. So what was his great, intricate plan to curb the council's power? You're the king, dum-dum. You can do whatever you want. What? Wolsey began writing bills that simply didn't require the seals. This is really important because... Henry is a pretty typical king to that point in terms of his relationship with Parliament and his advisors and his nobility. Uh, but it's Wolsey that's going to put the idea in Henry's head of absolute monarchy, uh, which is what the direction Henry's going to go. And by the time he's at the end of his reign, he's largely going to be able to do just whatever the heck he wants to which is what the kings in France have been able to do and, and what Henry really wants anyway. But he needed somebody he trusted to put that idea in his head and to give him the confidence that he could, in fact, take that kind of power. And thus, Henry was back on top. For his efforts, Wolsey began to climb the ranks, and he became something of a yes-man for King Henry, encouraging Henry to frolic and play while Wolsey took care of business. He was like a prime minister. Hey, kid, you want to go on an adventure? Do I ever? The Pope was at war with France and he needed some help. He offered the young, impressionable King Henry 100 Parmesan cheeses, some wine, and a golden rose if he came to the Pope's aid. And Henry was all in. At this point in his life, he still respected the yep. church and loved the Pope. And here was the chance for war he had been waiting for. He and why did he respect and love the Pope? Because at this point, he doesn't have a reason not to. And to the end of his life, Henry would say he was a loyal Catholic, okay? Don't get the impression that Henry breaking away from the church in Rome meant he was breaking away from the Catholic Church. He wasn't. He was just setting up the Church of England, which was a separate part of the Catholic Church. He still believed most of what the Catholic Church believed. There were some re reforms that happened, uh, but he never considered himself to be a Protestant. He hated the Protestants. He still didn't have an heir, a fairly big problem for a monarch at the time. But right now, the only kind of smashing he was interested in was smashing French guys in the face. And so off he went. The English already held the French city of Calais. From there, Henry made a glorious victory at the Battle of the Spurs. He took the French cities of Terouanne and Tournai. Word of his victory spread. This was it. Here was the glory he had been waiting for. And while he's in France, his wife, Catherine of Aragon, is going to be running the kingdom. He leaves her in charge as regent. And it's during that time that they're going to fight the Battle of Flodden Field against the Scottish. And that's where Henry's brother-in-law, James IV, is going to die in battle. Back home, his beautiful wife also led armies to victory in Scotland. And better yet, she was pregnant. Was the laser Soon, pig. Henry she would have an... Did that say pregnant? ...armies to victory in Scotland. And better yet, she was pregnant. She was pregnant. Um... If you haven't seen it, definitely check out. I don't even know the name of the channel. My kids introduced me to it, but there's a guy who goes through like the 
uh, like Yahoo questions or something like that and reads all the p- ways that people misspell and mispronounce pregnant, uh, asking stupid questions. It's pretty funny. I'm sure that's what that's a reference to. Soon, Henry would have an heir. All of Henry's wildest dreams were coming true. Oh, he ran out of money. As the French prepared to invade Italy, all Henry could do was go home. Well, at least now I have an heir to cheer me up. Bring me my son. To girl. Henry, this is Mary. Mary? That's a funny name for a boy. Henry, it's a girl. Ah! This was Catherine's fifth pregnancy that had not resulted in a male heir. Happy Henry. Yeah, some of these children had lived long enough to be given names and titles, um, but died fairly young. It wasn't like they all were stillborn or all died like at a day or two old. Uh, in fact, I want to pull this up real quick. So here's a list of the children uh, with Catherine of Aragon. He has a stillborn daughter. Then there's Henry, Duke of Cornwall, who lives about a month and a half. Uh, two unnamed sons who died shortly after birth, uh, Queen Mary, and then a daughter who was stillborn in the eighth month of pregnancy. Okay, so none of them lived longer than two months. For some reason, I was thinking at least one of the boys lived a little bit longer than that. Um, so there you go. Wasn't so happy anymore. You still haven't given me a male heir. Well, how do you know it's my problem? Maybe it's your problem, Henry. It couldn't be my problem because I've been boinking half your maid staff and one of them gave me a boy, uh, I mean, sure. There, there's only one illegitimate child that Henry ever acknowledges has as his, and it was a son. His name was Henry Fitzroy. Fitzroy meaning son of the king. Um, and it was with a woman named uh, Bessie Blunt or Elizabeth Blunt. And uh, he did acknowledge him. And there was some talk uh, further on in Henry's reign when he still didn't have a a son that they could legitimize Henry Fitzroy and make him uh, king after Henry. Um, And he was given some titles. um, But he ends up dying, I think, as a teenager, close to 20 years old. And uh, then Henry has a son with uh, one of his queens who ends up dying as a teenager as well. Sure. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it's my problem. I'll look into that. Cardinal Wolsey, now Henry's Lord Chancellor, knew his job depended on keeping Henry happy. And so he said, well, if you can't be the great warrior, then how about the great peacemaker? Not as cool, but okay. And so the field of the cloth of gold, a glamorous peace summit between England and France was held. The King of France, Francis I, was essentially the French version of King Henry. And the whole thing was basically one giant codpiece measuring contest. The two sides did agree to a peace treaty. However, it didn't last long. You see, there was a third major player in European politics. And during the field of the cloth of gold, Henry and Francis actually have a wrestling match. The king of England and the king of France wrestled each other, and Francis won. Politics at the time, an exquisite specimen of royal inbreeding, an heir to a huge inheritance, and a chin that could hit a home run. Absolutely. that They call it the Habsburg chin, a lot of inbreeding. This is Catherine of Aragon's nephew. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. He was Henry's wife's nephew. Henry had helped him out in the past to put down a Spanish rebellion. And now the two wanted to make an alliance. And so a marriage was arranged. Mary, I'd like to introduce you to your 22-year-old fully grown adult cousin. And now your future husband. Ew, he looks inbred. Mary! We're all inbred. With their new alliance, Charles and Henry agreed to team up and relaunch a campaign against France. In 1522, the English landed and stormed as far south as Agincourt, but Charles didn't commit significant force. So this is going to go on and on and on, right? England is not strong enough on its own to be taking on both France and Spain. So at any given point, depending on the situation, Henry's going to be allied with either France or Spain typically against the other one. And in this case, of course, Spain is also the Holy Roman Empire, so you're really taking on uh, Spain and Germany. Horses. Whoops, sorry man, not sure what happened. I'll join in next year. The next year, England swept northern France, almost taking Paris. But once again, where was Charles? Oh man, I'm so sorry. I promise, next year, I'll be there. The next year came, and a fed up Henry decided he was going to sit this one out. Just as Charles ravaged the French at the Battle of Pavia and captured the French king. Holy crap, dude. Yeah, I totally kicked France's butt. That's great. So, can I have the French throne like we agreed? Hmm. No. What? And also, I don't want to marry your ugly daughter anymore. Ugly? Have you seen your chin? Mummy says it's a strong chin for a strong boy. His mummy was crazy. I mean, legit insane. 
Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if I'd take her opinion on anything. As Henry's alliance with Charles fell apart, Henry knew his days as a warrior were over. This was a problem for Henry, but it was a bigger problem for his wife. Catherine of Aragon had two jobs. The first was to give Henry a male heir, but the second was to maintain an alliance with her relatives yep. in Spain, including her nephew. She had failed, and Henry's sexy... She had failed. Like, it's not really her responsibility, but the purpose of his marriage to Catherine was those two things. Neither of those things not coming through are her fault. Uh, and by all accounts, she seems to have been incredibly loyal to her husband. The eyes began to wander. Home from all his wars, Henry ate up his daily 5,000 calories of meat as an infatuation began to grow for one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Beautiful, intelligent, cultured. And... Uh, a sister of one of Henry's mistresses, Mary Boleyn, who probably had already been the mistress of the King of France uh, because their father, uh, the Earl of Wiltshire, was, well, he becomes Earl of Wiltshire, uh, is an ambassador for Henry to the court in France. She was exactly Henry's type. Now, Henry had had dozens of mistresses, including Anne's sister, but Anne didn't want to just be Henry's side chick. She wanted to be his queen. Henry sent dozens of letters, thirsty love poems. In one, he proclaimed that he would like to kiss her pretty duckies. Henry's loins were on fire, but Anne kept him at just the right distance to drive him crazy and push him to find a way to get rid of his current wife. Wolsey, I want a divorce. And as the representative of the Pope here in England, I expect you to sort it out quickly and quietly. And this was not a new thing, right? There had been divorces for royalty before, but Henry... The challenge for him is that this is a, a time in history when the Pope is also involved in alliances and wars and uh, people that he's got to keep happy. And so there's the complicated layer of diplomacy on top of all of this. And that's what's keeping Henry from being able to easily get his divorce. If situation had been different, the Pope would have just granted the divorce and all of history might have been different. I don't want this to turn into a Europe-wide scandal. You got it, your majesty. Hey, Big Papa! My boy Henry says he wants to divorce his wife! Any chance? To Henry's shock and horror, Wolsey deferred the case back to the Pope in Rome. To make matters worse, after all the wars in Europe, the Pope was currently under the thumb of Charles V. Now everybody knew what was going on, yep. and Henry's divorce trial had become a pawn of greater European politics. For Wolsey, the decision was a disaster. His job was to keep Henry happy, and Henry was very, very unhappy. Nevertheless, so you see, again, this is a situation where people who are in Henry's life that are going to get blamed by Henry for things that really are out of their control. Wolsey couldn't control this situation because this was a whole Europe-wide issue uh, that just was way beyond his scope. Uh, Catherine couldn't control the issues that were keeping her from being able to give Henry what he needed. The divorce trial began. Henry's case rested upon the Bible verse in Leviticus that claimed marrying your brother's widow would lead to childlessness, and Henry was certainly having a hard time getting a male heir. He argued that the Pope had got it wrong when he allowed Henry to marry his brother's widow, and that now divorce was the only solution. However, the Pope and Charles V acquired some interesting letters from an unknown source. He wants to kiss her pretty duckies? Man, this guy's loins are on fire. The Pope now knew the case for divorce may not actually be found in Henry's Bible, but in Henry's pants. Yep. After escaping Charles V, the Pope did send out one Cardinal Campaggio to oversee the trial. Campaggio was an old man racked with gout. It took and what you're talking about here is what's known as a papal legate. Remember, this is a time in history where you don't have instant communication. And you're talking hundreds of miles, even thousands of miles in some cases, uh, to travel for the, uh, the Pope's representatives. And so he appoints Campeggio to basically be his representative and to sort this out with the Pope's authority. It took him six painful months to travel from Rome to England. And when he finally got there, this kept happening. Hey, I need you to take a look at this evidence. I can't. My gout is acting up. Hey, are you ready to take my testimony? I can't. My gout is acting up. Hey, can you please make a decision? I can't. Your gout is acting up. My gout is acting up. Anne Boleyn, with her Protestant views and support of the Reformation, suspected the Pope was just delaying. For two whole years, the trial dragged on and on. And in the end, the Pope simply said, no. No divorce for you. 
Henry, the king that had previously defended the Pope militarily from France and intellectually from the reformist ideas of Martin Luther, who had once respected the Pope above all, now found the Pope standing between him and fourth base. Your Majesty, what will you do? I'm the king, dum-dum. I can do whatever I want. And remember, that's been put in his head by this point. You can do what you want. You're the king, this absolute authority. So when there's an authority above him, in this case the Pope and the church, who are saying you can't do something, well, a man who doesn't believe there's any such thing as something he shouldn't be able to do is going to find a way to make it legal for him to do it. What? For his failure, Henry removed Wolsey from the court, a decision that was likely influenced by Anne Boleyn, who disliked the cardinal. Yeah, and that's going to be a big theme of all of this, is that people who are close to Henry are going to use some of these situations to get rid of other people that are close to Henry. In this case, Anne Boleyn is going to help undermine Wolsey, get him removed. But then you're going to see, uh, in the wake of Cardinal Wolsey, you're going to eventually see a guy named Cromwell, Thomas Cromwell, who's going to rise to power. And it's going to be his desire to get rid of the influence of the Boleyns that's going to help precipitate their downfall. And then you're going to have people that undermine Cromwell. So there's always this going on, this back and forth between people close to Henry to try and get rid of who they want to. Wolsey's going to eventually uh, actually be arrested and he probably would have stood trial for treason and might have ended up one of the people executed by Henry VIII if he hadn't died. Having fallen from grace and with potential charges of treason over his head, Wolsey died of illness a year later. Then, Henry set about removing England from the influence of the Pope. Hey, if you do that, I'll excommunicate you. Who cares, man? Oh no, apathy, my weakness. So excommunication wasn't just simply some symbolic thing. In the 16th century, to be excommunicated by the Pope was to be removed from your communion with the church. And in the minds of most people, that meant you were going to hell. It was the greatest power that the Pope had was to say, I'm cutting you off from the church. I'm cutting you off from Christ. You're going to go to hell if you die. And then you know, presumably that person would then do anything they could to get back in the Pope's good graces. But that what you see him here with this whole I'm melting thing is, oh my gosh, if you don't buy the idea that I'm cutting you off from Christ and you're going to hell, I really have no power. Yes. Henry gathered theologians and scholars together to help him make his case against the Pope. Together, they argued to the people of England that the Pope's rule over the church was basically a takeover of what had once been a self-governing national English church. And if that sounds familiar, some historians do believe this moment may have laid the foundations for English Euroscepticism. That's right, Brexit may have been influenced by Henry's explosive loins. By and large, the people gave Henry their support, and those that didn't were going to be in for a rough time. But for now, Henry assumed the role of supreme head of the English church, and his next divorce trial was a foregone conclusion. Catherine of Aragon was Aragon, and Anne Boleyn was in. All right, I've upended the entire country to be with you, so you'd better give me a son, okay? Now, did you get my letter about the duckies? Having finally married the girl of his dreams, it was party time for Henry. And what a party. Life in the Tudor court was non-stop. So remember, at this point, he's in his early 40s. He, this is, I think, 1533 when he marries Anne Boleyn and their daughter Elizabeth, who's going to go on to be Queen Elizabeth I, uh, is born later that year. A lot of people speculate they were, she had already gotten pregnant with Elizabeth by the time they actually were able to have their wedding. Huge banquets, with each person eating on average 5,000 calories a day. And no vegetables. Those are for poor people. Rich people ate meat. And so you know what else is for rich people? Constipation. But don't let that stop the party. The toilets are communal. And Henry himself was the center of everything. He ate the best food. He had 1,200 pairs of shoes. He didn't even have to wipe his own bum bum. Life was great. The groom of the stool. That was his responsibility. It was actually a prestigious position that you were thought very highly of if you were the guy in that position. Great. Everyone, I give you your majesty, King Henry VIII. But how did they pay for it all? Well, influenced by his fairly Protestant new wife, since Henry had overturned the organization of the church, this is how they paid for it. Oh my goodness, how awful. Selling fake fragments of the cross? Vials of Jesus' blood that you got from a duck? Using religion in this way? This is terrible. I must confiscate all this money at once. 
And just speaking from a historic standpoint, this is one of the most tragic events in history. Not because of the religious component to all of it. You could argue one way or the other about that. There were some legitimate arguments to some of this relic stuff that was going on that was definitely designed to extort money from people. There's no doubt of that. There was definitely corruption in the church. But in his suppression of the monasteries and the disillusion of all these these religious houses and these religious properties in order to confiscate all this wealth and either keep it for himself or give it to people who were close to him, we lose a lot of incredibly significant historic sites in the process. Yes, how awful. I must take all of this away immediately. Monasteries across the nation were dissolved and their riches placed in the royal coffers. Obviously, many people weren't too happy about this, but Henry had a plan for that as well. Henry's descent into tyranny had begun, as any who rejected his new claim as supreme head of the English church found their heads on the chopping block. So the Bishop, bishop of Rochester, I think it is, John Fisher, um, is one of the men who refuses to acknowledge Henry as head of the church. And... Uh, he's going to be eventually arrested and put on trial for treason for refusing to acknowledge this. Uh, it didn't even matter if you didn't say anything at all, because guys like Thomas More just stay completely silent on the issue. He doesn't speak out against it. He doesn't say anything negative. He just doesn't support it. But the Bishop of Rochester, uh, John Fisher, is going to be made a cardinal by the Pope. The Pope thinking Henry wouldn't dare execute a cardinal, a prince of the church. Pope was wrong on that one. And so Henry partied. He danced. He sang. He ate. He jousted. Oh, yeah. Be me. Love gluttony. Violate widows. In 1536, Henry fell from his horse in a jousting accident. Not for the first time, but certainly the heaviest fall he had taken. So... There's concern he might actually die when this happens. He was injured pretty severely. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is the point at which he descends into madness. And some people argue it's brain damage. I think it's more likely he actually got a wound on his thigh that never completely healed. This is, we're talking mid 1530s, and he's going to live till 1547, I think January 1547. And for the rest of his life, this wound is going to be there and it's going to get infected and it's going to fester and it's going to smell so bad that like, like people couldn't even sometimes be in the same room with him. There's no way you have an infection like that without it affecting you in significant ways. Just the, the pain and the frustration of that is going to lead to mental issues, but also that infection might have actually done something chemically to him. And I think this is a turning point in Henry's life. And this is where we're going to start to see the descent into executions. And uh, he's going to turn on Anne Boleyn. He's going to turn on his own advisors. Taken yet, some historians believe the brain damage caused by the incident may have violently accelerated Henry's descent into tyranny. Yeah. Executions in England ramped up. During his reign, it's estimated 57 to 72,000 people were put to death. Rich or poor, big or small, no one was safe. Mm. And the most prominent victim of all was to be Henry's own wife. It had been three years since their marriage and had been pregnant four times, yet she had only been able to produce one healthy child, a girl. What's more, it's possible she had been going around insulting Henry's manhood. Henry's eyes, once again, began to wander. His new top man, Thomas Cromwell, didn't want to end up like Cardinal Wolsey, and so he came up with a plan. And by the way, there is a relationship between Thomas Cromwell and Oliver Cromwell, who will lead the English Civil War a century later. They are related. In fact, Oliver Cromwell's last name wasn't actually Cromwell. That was like a name that they took from like an aunt or an uncle or something, but it is the same family of Cromwell's. Um, and Cromwell's one of the main people that's really pushing Henry on the dissolution of the monasteries. He's going to be a big uh, factor in Anne Boleyn and the others who are going to be executed. And they use this Anne Boleyn thing to deal with some other um, people that just they needed an excuse to get rid of in the court. 
who had probably nothing at all to do with Anne Boleyn. There was a court musician who had been quite flirtatious in public with the Queen. Well, Thomas Cromwell and his boys got a forced confession out of him, saying that it didn't stop at innocent flirtation. And the charges came rolling in. Listen, Anne, we need to talk. Oh no, you're going to divorce me, aren't you? Just like your last wife. Oh, n no, come here, shh, no. I'm not going to divorce you. It's much worse than that. Anne was charged with adultery, perversion, even incest, and plotting with to kill the king himself. The jury found her guilty, including her own uncle and ex-fiancé, both fearing the wrath of the king. Her uncle was the, um, the Duke of Norfolk, which is like the premier duke in the kingdom. Uh, it's the Howard family. Uh, and in fact, she'll be both of Henry's wives that are going to be executed are going to be from the Howard family. And on May 19th, 1536, Anne Boleyn was Anne Boleyn. Literally the next day, Henry married... Yeah, so uh, at this point, Thomas More's been executed. Bishop John Fisher has been executed uh, for not acknowledging Henry as head of the church. I think that happened in 1535. 1536, you're going to see Anne Boleyn executed. And she's not going to be executed with an axe like the others were. And they weren't all executed in the tower. A lot of these executions will take place other places on Tower Hill sometimes. Like I think Thomas More was executed on Tower Hill, which is kind of up above the tower behind it if you're looking from the Thames River. Um, but he's buried in the same place as Anne, which is the Church of St. Peter Ad Vincula, which is within the tower limits. Um, yeah, and so it was a common thing for Henry to kind of find his next lover or his next wife from among the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, and that's where he's going to get Jane Seymour. One of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, his third wife. After Anne had smack-talked his manhood, and since he still had no male heir, Henry went on a campaign to ensure the public knew he was as virile as it gets. He had this famous portrait painted of the manliest man I've ever seen, and later he would even have his physician make a declaration about his health. King Henry is a fine specimen of a man, and ugh, please don't make me say this. Say it. <sighs> and every time I look at him, I wish I was a woman. The truth is, after his jousting accident, the king had badly injured his leg and was no longer very active, yet he was still eating his daily 5,000 calories. So by now, Henry was extremely unhealthy. For the remainder of his life, he would incur a number of illnesses, and his injured leg ulcers would ooze stinking pus. A fine specimen of a man indeed. On the church front, Henry's new and now pregnant wife was a devout Catholic, and she pleaded with the king to reinstate the monasteries. Henry was sick of wives meddling in his business, and he bluntly warned her to remember what happened to Anne Boleyn. Yep. Since splitting with the Pope, Henry had been hard at work determining the theology of his new Church of England. It kept many Catholic traditions, while on the other hand embracing some reformist ideas, such as requiring the use of a new Bible, not in Latin, but in English. The cup and this is a big deal because you got to remember that people have been executed for translating the Bible from Latin into their own language because it was considered something that only the educated people like priests were able to read the Bible. It wasn't like the, the average farmer in the field could read the Bible at that point. The cover of Henry's new Bible depicted the people appearing to worship a giant King Henry. And in the corner, there's some people being put to death, just for good measure. For any who opposed Henry's ideas, whether Catholic or Protestant, for any who rebelled against him, it would be off with their heads. So Robert Ask is part of uh, a rebellion that's known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, which is this huge gathering of Catholics who want a restoration of their monasteries want a restoration of feast days and all the very traditional catholic things uh and he and it's it's intended to be a peaceful demonstration they get like 20 30 000 people to gather and henry gives them all these promises that they'll disperse and go home and they disperse and go home but then somebody when he doesn't immediately give them what they want somebody else starts to kind of stir them up again and this time he rounds up all of the ringleaders of the Pilgrimage of Grace and has them executed. Robert Ask is going to be hanged in chains from the castle in York. Uh, and just he just goes on this absolute rampage and executes a ton of people and really cracks down even further. In October 1537, Henry finally got what he had been waiting for. His wife Jane gave birth to a healthy boy. However, the triumph soon turned to tragedy as Jane Seymour died days later from complications during the birth. Henry mourned Infection. Jane, the woman who had given him a son for two years. Your Majesty, 
it's time to choose your next wife. So Henry does go into kind of a depression, um, and he's only going to eventually come out of it when he is going to meet his fifth wife, but first the fourth wife thing, and this is going to be the downfall of Cromwell. Thomas, not now. Can't you see I'm in mourning? That one. The woman Thomas Cromwell had lined up for Henry's next marriage was the sister of a powerful German duke. But all Henry cared about was that she was pretty as pie. And Thomas Cromwell promised that indeed she was. However, when she arrived in England, Henry was less than pleased. Your Majesty, let me introduce you to your fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Wh what's that smell? Uh, I think it's your legs, sire. No, it's Anne of Cleves. She's ugly. This is treason. What? Off? With his head. Henry found his new wife so repulsive that he never consummated the marriage. And he, he claimed that she looked like a horse. He called her a Flanders mare. Um, he had commissioned Hans Holbein to do a portrait of her so he could see what she looked like before he married her. Uh, and Holbein was a fantastic artist. He's the guy who did many of the paintings that Henry commissioned. Uh, so there's no reason to believe he was misleading in what he painted. But when he met her, he just decided he didn't like her. But the funny thing is, they're going to actually go on to become very good friends. She's going to be treated as a sister of the king. She's going to be wealthy. She never leaves England, never remarries. And in fact, she's the only one of Henry's six wives that's actually buried at Westminster Abbey. And divorced her just six months later. And for bringing Henry an ugly, stinky woman, along with additional charges of plotting treason, Thomas Cromwell lost his head. And this was a factor of uh, a lot of things that the the Anne of Cleves things, that was the excuse that was used by Cromwell's enemies to bring him down. He was this commoner who had risen to this incredibly important position of influence and authority. And a lot of the nobility who were close to Henry didn't like the influence he had, so they brought him down. The very same day of Cromwell's execution, Henry married his fifth wife, the famed beauty Catherine Howard. She's believed to have only been 17 at the time. Henry was 49. And like Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard didn't last long. You see, for some reason, she may not have been entirely satisfied with her 49-year-old fine specimen of a man. And it's possible she engaged in a number of extramarital affairs, including one with her cousin, Thomas Culpepper. When Henry yeah, Culpepper was her cousin, and uh, she is raised as a kind of an orphan. She's almost raised in like this orphanage situation by the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. Because uh, she's related to the Howards, who are the Dukes of Norfolk. Uh, and I, I think it's almost certain that she had a relationship with Culpepper, who was a very close um, member of Henry VIII's inner circle. Um, and there's also this problem, this guy Francis Derham, that she had probably been sleeping with before she had come to know Henry, uh, who comes and uses the fact that he had slept with the Queen before she was the Queen to get an important position that paid well, and that's gonna to lead to his downfall too. Henry found out he was devastated. How could she do this to me? But sire, don't you have hundreds of mistresses? Shut up, Barry, that's not the point. <laughs> your majesty, you're crying. I'm not crying. It's just that sometimes when I get sad, water, comes out of my eyes! For her treason, Catherine Howard met the same fate as Anne Boleyn in 1542. And executed at the same time she was, was Lady Rochford, who was the widow of Anne Boleyn's brother. Remember, when Anne Boleyn was executed in 1536, there were several men that were implicated of having slept with her, and she almost certainly had not done anything with these guys. It was just an excuse to bring these guys down and to take her down too. Uh, so her husband or her brother George was executed for incest with her, uh, and so this is his widow. And, and Lady Rochford's the one that kind of arranges the meetings between Catherine Howard and Thomas Culpepper. Culpepper, by the time Catherine Howard's executed, Culpepper's been long since beheaded and his head put on London Bridge. Francis Derham, who slept with her before she even knew the king gets hanged, drawn, and quartered, and his head put on uh, Tower Bridge. Uh, and then Lady Rochford's executed as well. And Catherine Howard, teenager, executed. Uh, she requests the night before that the block be brought into her room at uh, the Tower of London so she could practice laying her head on it. 
So, we've had divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, look and out, survived. here comes survived. Henry married the daughter of a royal official, Catherine Parr, in 1543, and she appears to have been a good companion to Henry. She cared for the aging king, who by now was so heavy it took several men to winch him onto his horse. She acted as a mediator within the family and convinced the king to restore his two daughters to the line of succession. The their marriage did have one hiccup, however, when Catherine dared disagree with the king over the subject of theology. It's a miracle because when the priest says the words of institution, the bread turns into the body of Christ. Well, if you put the bread in a box for three months, is it a miracle that it turns moldy? This was one of the points of contention between the more Protestant-minded people and the more traditional Catholics was, does communion become literally the body and blood of Jesus or is it just symbolic? And this was the kind of thing that you could find yourself burned at the stake if you were on the wrong side of that issue, uh, depending on who was in charge. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's true. And, and Jane Seymour, to her credit, she's going to navigate this really well. And she understands how to deal with Henry and how to play to his ego and to his vanity and she's able to navigate this well enough she's gonna outlive him. <gasps> treason! You can't just call everything treason, Henry. The king called for her arrest as serious charges were placed over her head. However, in the end, she told Henry that she had not been disagreeing with him, but simply learning from him. And yep. so when the guards came to arrest her, the king told them to make like an M and cleave. <laughs> and she'll go on after Henry dies to marry the brother of Jane Seymour, and she'll actually end up dying as a result of childbirth with the child that she had with him. Catherine Parr stayed with Henry right until the end. As he aged into his later years, in increasing pain and ill health, he grew ever more suspicious and moody. Yeah. The once generous, promising young king was now feared by all around him. And at one point, he'll actually have a very old lady executed. Uh, that's how paranoid he's getting anybody who might have a threat uh, to him. Uh, so going back to his grandfather, Edward IV, right? Edward had several brothers. One brother was killed during the Wars of the Roses. Uh, another brother is Richard III, who's going to die in battle against Henry's father. Uh, and then the other brother was George, who was the Duke of Clarence, who actually had been executed on orders of his own brother after a trial for treason for rebelling against his brother Edward IV. But the Duke of Clarence had two children. He had a son and a daughter. His son had been executed years earlier. The daughter is Margaret Pole, uh, who is, I think, the Countess of Salisbury. Uh, and as an old woman, she's going to have several children, including one of her sons who's going to become a cardinal. Um, and there were a lot of people who were focusing on him as not only being a Catholic, but also having a claim to the throne. And because Henry can't get at her son, uh, I think Reginald was his name, he goes after his mother instead. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Hold me. Of course, sire. Do you have any final wishes? Uh, how, uh, how about... How about one last conquest in France? And so in 1544, Henry made for Calais. The pesky French had been supporting the Scottish in their ongoing wars with England, and they also owed Henry some money. So the extremely unhealthy king personally led a siege against the French city of Boulogne. The English dug tunnels under the castle, and on the 13th of September, the French surrendered. A glorious victory for Henry. In actuality, the whole misadventure nearly bankrupt England, and they ended up giving Boulogne back to the French a few years later. But shh, don't tell Henry. He's having his moment. Finally, in 1547, a 55-year-old Henry, lapsing in and out of consciousness, passed away. His son, Edward, succeeded him, but died just five years later. His daughter, Mary, briefly took the reins and steered the country back towards the Pope. But then his second... And they call her Bloody Mary. That's the Mary that we're talking about because of the, the Protestants that were executed when she was queen. His second daughter embraced reformist ideas and gradually transformed England into a Protestant country. Henry's desperation to marry Anne Boleyn and his resulting feud with the Pope had changed the course of English history and religion forever. Unfortunately, none of Henry's children had heirs, and when Elizabeth I died, Henry's lineage ended, with the House of Stuart replacing the House of Tudor. And the Stuarts are his sister who married James IV of Scotland. They're descended from Henry's sister. So all of the Stuarts, even though there are no uh, living legitimate lines of Henry VIII today, uh, all of the future monarchs of England are going to descend from his sister. So then you might think, all that effort, a life filled with so much frustration, yet he never conquered France, he barely had a male heir, and his lineage died out. The egotistical man Henry 
grew sick and cruel, and then died. So why are we all so fascinated with King Henry VIII? Why not Henry II or IV? Well, without mentioning the many important things his reign did achieve, one of his biggest goals was to go down in history. And you can put a big green check yep. beside that one. Because everything he did, and how he asserted his control and authority over everyone around him, has come to be viewed as the epitome of the word king. And also because of the wife killings? Yeah, definitely the wife killings. Yep. Divorce, beheaded, and died. Divorce, beheaded, survived. Everybody remembers that. Now there's a Broadway musical called Six, which is basically uh, this kind of Spice Girls type thing where you have the six wives of Henry VIII performing. And we're going to be actually going to see it here in a couple of months when it comes to Cleveland. So uh, interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Like I said, uh, throw up a link to some of the other videos. All of the other oversimplified links are going to be down in the description, or at least most of them, if you want to check those out. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.